Good morning, good morning. How are you? Are you? Oh. Oh, jolly good. Come on, start. That's the last thing I need. Got a car behind me. Just a second, just a... Just. Here, they, here they go, look. Oh, this is God. Now, I don't know if you believe in God, but there's one surefire proof of the existence of God, and that is a country lane along which absolutely no traffic passes until you get in the car and then you have a convoy, rubber duck, of 12 cars who just go past and all get in front of you. That, my friends, is God, who has an excellent sense of humour. As Rabbi Lionel Blue always used to say, If you don't believe me, I'll, there's another test for God. It's also a driving one. Don't know why he's obsessed with driving, but anyway, perhaps he's just obsessed with testing people and frustrating them. But again, you can pull out at a junction, or, or come up, pull up to a T-junction, at which there's never a car anywhere, normally, and then all of a sudden, across your path will come about 300 cars, probably behind a combine harvester. That, my friends, is God. He's a wag. Anyway, how are you? It's a lovely uh, morning. Low white cloud. Not too warm. My birthday's coming up. It's May the uh, something or other. Let's have a look. Oh, God. The 6th or the 8th? I don't know. The 8th. Okay. Yeah, so the eighth, I don't know, the eighth is alright as a day, isn't it? Sort of, it's sort of fun, and you've got over the shock of paying the staff, haven't you, on the last day of the last month. And, you know, you possibly, you know, you've paid your mortgage or your rent or something, and uh, you've got a, you've got a, you're in the middle of the month, which unfortunately for me is not good because my mortgage goes out on the 15th, so I have to worry about how to pay that. But the eighth is a no man's land. A financial no man's land for me, so I'm, I'm reasonably happy. So anyway, I'm sort of uh, you know thinking about what to chat about, and uh, a lot of uh, a lot of thought goes into these subjects, as you can probably tell. You know, a lot of research and preparation, and uh, and as I was climbing into the car this morning, I thought I'll talk about the young young practitioners, the challenges facing young practitioners today compared to the challenges facing young practitioners when I qualified in 1980. <laughs> and, um, the, and then I thought, well, you know, that really sort of leads into the changing dynamics, doesn't it, of the profession. So, I mean, it might be a larger subject than I think, but anyway, the point, the point that, I think the major point that I'm gonna probably make when sort of looking back on it, and that's, it's the only, it's, you know, Oh, I've got to start saying you know as well. Okay, I've got to start saying. <laughs> feel free to shout at me if I keep saying you know, because I do actually listen to these things afterwards. In fact, uh, I would imagine I probably account for ten percent of the uh, times this video is played just by <laughs> listening to it, because we all love the sound of our own voice, don't we? But I do like to find out how it's all gone, and also uh, try and. Uh, uh, remember what I was talking about because it's quite difficult but then when it's unplanned it's quite difficult to say it's a bit like a night at the pub you know when you know it's a bit like a night at the pub not you know when uh, you try and uh, remember what you did and uh, because you're not in the you're in the moment you, uh, you're in the moment and not uh, not remembering it all so changing face of the profession Also, I'd like to clarify that I did not have a mini stroke in my last video log or vlog. I lost my train of thought, which is not uncommon. I mean, it is quite uncommon, actually. I generally do do these in, in a single shot, as you know, as you know. <laughs> but, but I was, you know, things come up. I am driving at the end of the day, okay? So I do reserve the right to concentrate on not crashing into anything. Uh, as opposed to just talking to you, so uh, so I uh, and what happened was I um, my my train of thought wandered off, 
and um, I thought at the time I thought to myself I, I'll cut that bit out it's very rare to me to make a cut but I thought it doesn't matter I'll make a cut and then uh, I completely forgot <laughs> so in the middle of my last video there was about 30 seconds of me staring in space like I'd had a mini straight um, but by then it's all been codecked and decodecked and I've had the titles put on and it's been uploaded to YouTube and everything I can't be honest to the most I'm going to do at that point is put something in the notes saying please ignore the silence in the middle. Anyway, so so I went up to, um, I think it was Birmingham Dental School. It's not recently, it was a few years ago now and uh, they asked me to go and talk about, you know, what's it like to work in general practice. So I thought, oh that's great because I had a real thirst to know what it was like to work in general practice when I was a student. And in fact, that was one of the reasons why I joined the old GDPA as it was at the time, because it was an organization of general practitioners and I, I sort of pretty well knew that's what I wanted to do even well before I qualified. Uh, I'd had enough of academia, I really, and I, I wasn't really, I didn't really like academia, you know, I, I was, I'm a more of a, it was a vocational degree for me and I was a vocational sort of person. I wanted to get out and, and do something, do some dentistry, not, uh, you know, write papers for the BDJ. So, um, so that's yeah. So that's the reason why I joined the GDPA. And um, when I was at this in Manchester, in in uh, Manchester, but doesn't matter anyway. The point was that uh, you know there were about uh, thirty students in the audience, which which you know for me I thought was quite low because there were fifty in my class at school, dental school, and when you know something was on, we all went to it. You know, it wasn't like. It wasn't like a sort of an optional extra, you know, that, that, that was on the curriculum, the old agenda, and so you went along. And there were sort of 20 sitting near the class who were quite interested, and another 10 sitting at the back on their laptops, just chatting to each other, you know, not at all taking any notice of the... Uh, of the and it was so... I wouldn't say... It, let's say it wouldn't... It's not like it sort of put me off, it's just that it... Um, how can I put it? I felt so disrespectful. So disrespectful, especially as I travelled all the way to Manchester or Birmingham at my own expense and taken a day off work to talk to these guys, you know, to try and help them out. And there they were just uh, browsing porn or something. I don't know what they were doing, but uh, anyway, they were, they were in the lecture theatre and they were just interfering with the lecture, really, as far as I was concerned. So I decided not to go there again. Or not to do that again, because I, I figured it was not, you know, I mean, this is a sort of... I don't know. It seemed to me the sort of thing that the Dean had just asked people to do just to fill up a bit of the academic year. So I didn't bother. And um, the, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna complain about the students, today's students, because I think for the most part, they are very well trained and the quality of their work is high. So I um, so don't think this is gonna be an anti, you know, students of today sort of type rant. But to, to give you an idea of uh, what the motivation was in my year, and this will be for, you know, if your GDC number's around 56,000, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. In fact, I had a patient of um, another dentist come to me, and she started talking about him, and she said, oh yeah, he's a... Uh, He's getting ready for retirement. He's a bit old-fashioned, blah blah blah. And he, 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 he said this to me, and he said that to me. And I said to me, oh, that's, that's a, I, bet his, "I bet his GDC number is fifty-six thousand, uh, like nine hundred and two." And I, I shouted to Penny in reception. I said, "Look, this dentist up on the GDC website, which is, and that's about the only thing you can get now on the GDC website is the is the number. You can't get an address or anything." So. So she had to sort of guess which one it was. And she says, it's 56,871. And I thought, oh yeah, I was within 100 of his GDC number just from listening to the patient talk about how, he's, how he did his dentistry. And that's, uh, that's really how much things have changed. Well, the other thing that's changed is that they're not all sequential now. So, you know, you've got <laughs> someone who qualified recently might be 777,901. But um, anyway, where was I? Oh yeah, so, youth of today. Well, I mean, I qualified and went straight into general practice. 
and uh, on the first day that I possibly could. So I was sort of licensed on the December the 31st and then and then it was a weekend and then on the Monday morning I already had a job lined up with 40 patients booked in and 40 was about right uh, but you had to count a crown prep as four so obviously every patient is one and but a crown prep is four so over a day you could have like 36 patients and a crown prep or uh, 32 patients and two crown preps you know that was the way and that's an excellent system. If I had to go back on the NHS, I'd probably still use that system. And um, all the people in my year were sort of they're quite well motivated towards doing dentistry, by which I mean they joined because they wanted to be dentists, you know. Um, and there was this thing going round about dentists being failed doctors, and, and, and it was true that there were probably always one or two people on the course who applied for medicine and hadn't got into medicine and sort of got into dentistry instead. Oh, bollocks. Sorry. <laughs> I was supposed to stop there <laughs> and pick something up and I've completely driven past it. I wonder if I've got time to go back. As usual, the clock on my, uh, clock on my uh, car and my watch say completely... My unfit bit has gone completely... <laughs> <laughs> it's showing completely the wrong time, which means I haven't moved around enough to wind it up. Oh dear, and I'll, I'll forget it. Now you can see, those of you who are very astute will notice I'm only wearing one pair of glasses, and that's because I left my glasses around my daughter's house when I was babysitting over the weekend. And so uh, I was going to go and pick them up, but um, I'll pick them up later. Yeah, so uh, we went out to general practice and uh, we worked very hard, and but and we were very motivated to do dentistry. And um, but then there was a sort of a sea change after the uh, uh, you know about the, in the mid '90s with this. There, the composition of the applicants changed, and it was one of two for, for two reasons. One was the Department of Health wanted to change the. App, uh, the composition of the applicants because you won't believe it but I mean for the first part of the uh, well for, for the sort of the for the entire 80s the worry was that the dentists were going to be in oversupply that there were too many of us and uh, they were you know they shut down dental schools they shut down university college where I uh, qualified because they thought that there was a capacity issue an over capacity issue so they shut down two dental schools and they, what they wanted to do was manipulate the workforce, so it actually did less work. Unbelievable. And the way they did that was by bumping up the increase of uh, the non-male gender. Uh, on the basis that, for whatever reason, the non-male gender tends to work less. I mean, you know, I mean, this is only speculation. And, and, and as with all such policies, it wasn't uh, written down anywhere. But women tend to have babies which means that they tend to have time off work they tend to uh, have husbands who more likely to perhaps have full-time jobs than husbands are to have wives who have full-time jobs that can support the family and so uh, you know women are more often part-time um, are more often less concerned about uh, grossing high amounts and um, and less concerned about working altogether, to be quite honest, if my wife's anything to go by. So, and the idea was that this was sort of, a, it was a sneaky, and of course it was right on, wasn't it? It was right on politically correct to try and improve the uh, ratio of men to women. Not that I'm saying that the ratio was, was correct. I mean, it really, was, there weren't many women in the profession, but, and it was true that, uh, but anyway, so, so it all fitted together. And then, what happened was there was after the 92 uh, fee cut and, and all the big hoo-ha and the national strike and everything then there was a big complete volt fast which is a turnaround in case you're not Italian and uh, they uh, they then the problem then became uh, people were working less on the health service so all of a sudden rather than having too many NHS dentists they had too few so they had to start coming up with ideas to, to get more people to do more NHS work 
So then that's when they started encouraging women to come back into dentistry and stop, you know, get off the bloody maternity leave and uh, unretire. <laughs> so the lesson behind this is that nothing ever managed centrally by government is works better than it would if it was left to its own devices, okay? Because the, the, the whole point was that it was not like dentists were employed or uh, given the capital to set up. We were all risking our own capital. We were all self-employed. We were all self-employed subcontractors risking our own capital. And the market has a way of sorting these things out. If, you've, if you're risking your own capital, then what happens is you'll, you'll put it where you think that there's the least risk and, the, and maximize your rate of return. You'll do that naturally. And uh, that tends to be the place that uh, people need dentists. I mean, let's face it. I mean, as a dentist, when I set up my first practice in 1984, I did a ton of research, far more than any local authority would ever do, about where there are, uh, where the dentists were in Kent, where the population centres were in Kent. Um, and uh, I, you know, because it's a big off, it's a big old investment, you know, and it's a one off. You can't like after a year later say, no, nah, I'm going to move it 10 yards up the road. You can't, it's, once it's there, it's there. So, uh, so anyway, so the government after 1990 got into the micromanagement, but also the, there was a sea change in the type of person coming into dentistry. And the type of person was, was more, money motivated they were they didn't come in because you know they thought they might want to be in a medical profession or they might want to heal people or <coughs> you know do technical good technical work or anything they came in because they they or rather their parents had realized that in the uh, you know recession ridden dent uh, UK that dentistry was as a profession was one of the, the professions where you could earn a lot of money you were pretty well guaranteed to earn a lot of money and employment was high um, so <clears throat> so there was a, and there was a shortage so what happened was a bunch of kids you know sort of a, with Ferengi minded parents were told that they were going to do dentistry not not because they wanted to do dentistry or knew anything about dentistry at all but because it was it made dentistry was what made you money and what defined you in life was what was making money and therefore if dentistry made money then you were going to do dentistry yeah and so these sort of frankie minded parents and, and the kids were like the sort of kids who just did what they were told they were like their parents just told them what to do and they did it and so of course they uh, th this the whole whole culture change really in terms of the in intake from people who were at all interested in dentistry or materials or anything uh, to just a bunch of people who were excited sort of sexually excited by the amount of money that could be made over a lifetime of working as a dental surgeon and uh, so dentistry at that point really became commoditized it didn't become it, you know it ceased to be a, a profession as such uh, or an honourable profession anyway, it just became, um, it just became a, a commodity and a way to earn. And that's, that, I think that's just reflected, those, those practitioners now are, you know, getting to the point where they're owning their own surgeries and, and but the emphasis is always on money. It's never on a toothache, <laughs> you know, except as a, as a means to make money. <laughs> so, I don't know whether it's, you know, I mean, personally, obviously, you know, you can tell from what I'm saying that I don't think that's a good idea. I don't think commoditizing dentistry was good. I think the Department of Health played along with that because when they came up with the UDA system, you know, the, the old uh, unitized and quantized dentistry and uh, just, you know, you, you were, a, <laughs> it's like they remained at it, didn't they? <laughs> they sort of, you know, it wasn't so much of uh, a dental treatment plan was an examination of to varying degree followed by an artistic interpretation of what needed to be done to get that patient to, to maximize their oral health. And the Department of Health's approach was you know, chuck it all in a bin, Ch chuck all the treatments in a bin and we'll sell it by the bin. <laughs> so you can buy a bin load. Basically there'll be three bin loads 
small, medium, and large, like the baby, like the like the, like the bear's porridge, and uh, you can you can just have buy whichever remainder bin is 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 right for you, you know. <laughs> God. So <clears throat> so now, I mean, I'm looking for an associate to help me in my practice, in a private practice, where where expense is no object basically, and time is no object and someone could take their training and really you know do do something quite how can i put it significant with their with their their vocation and um and yeah you know my the last uh, very pleasant young lady who we took on um was just wanted to work with us part time because uh, she was waiting for her nhs performance number and it was taking longer than she wanted so she thought she'd sort of slum it privately while she was waiting to go on the NHS and I don't you know and in a way you know <clears throat> I told my technician and he expressed a lot of surprise about her choices in life you know the way that she was possibly turning down an opportunity that not many people are afforded and I certainly wasn't afforded when I uh, was he was a young dentist but we know from the Nasdaq figures that NHS dentists earn £130,000 a year as the same as private so really it's just a case of it's all it all comes down to what sort of dentistry do you want to do doesn't it again you know it's do you want to do mass market uh, high volume low quality repeat restorative work or do you want to do stuff knowing that the patient's not going to be coming back you know, for that particular crown for probably the rest of their life, hopefully. Uh, it's the, the commoditized approach to dentistry is winning, especially in the current economic climate, where you know the, the population is trillions in debt, and uh, and again we've had a couple of patients in in the last few weeks where we've done, they, yeah, I don't think I think that's my grandmother. And uh, she's, uh, um, you know, we've had some patients in who don't want to go on the NHS, let's put it that way, you know, they've been to the NHS, they've seen it, they don't like it. So what they do is they, they ring around and they find that we're their local private dentist. And, um, you know, go on, do you want to go? Go on, yeah. I'd rather crash into you than you crash into me. And, uh, yeah, so what we do is we give them a quote and then they say, um, you know, I'm sorry, I didn't realise it was going to be so expensive. Not that it is it's so expensive, but I suppose that's just another thing is it's a market thing. You're going to have to keep a, you have to keep ahead of these things, you know, to say, is this a trend? You know, are we going to get now a lot of people coming in and turning the quotes down because they can't even afford what we charge? But, you know, to finish on, on a more positive note, I mean, I had a bloke come in, he got no teeth. I mean, he's... he's Typical, uh, you know, bloke with like two or three teeth at the front sticking out. <laughs> Terrible teeth. He comes in because he's a husband of a, of a patient of ours, a lady, very nice lady. Spent half an hour going on about how he couldn't afford our treatment plan because um, uh, because he got no money. And then um, I bumped into him at the weekend at the local flying club where he's just bought himself a brand new 20,000 pound single engine airplane Dude, people lie they're lying bastards these are lying fucking bastards <laughs> I don't hold it against him if he wants to spend money on flying rather than his teeth then that's fine by me I don't mind I just don't like the lies the lies <laughs> okay alright I'm at work have a nice day see you tomorrow bye